Hello, everyone. This is your favorite internet radio show, the Sticky Buttons Podcast. And this is your host, Brandon. And this is Blake. And we're coming at you with our 83rd episode. 83, a magical number. It almost looks like 88, but not quite. (laughs) Not quite. Only five short, really. (laughs) Man, we've got a great show. (laughs) That that really threw me off. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Well, we've got a great show today. (laughs) I really wanted to bring up a game that we talked about before, just right off the bat. I guess we'll just jump into it. (laughs) I guess after that, I feel like we've got to. (laughs) So this is a game that I think I shouted out the demo a little bit ago. And this is a game that I got to see and demo at PAX East. So this game featured in our PAX East episode, as well as I'm pretty sure I brought up the demo as well. But this game is called Astria, the Six-Sided Oracles. And Brandon, this game rules. I am so... I just honestly, like, it is just such a great game. So I guess really quick, it's kind of like a deck building roguelike, but it's instead of building a deck of cards, you build a deck of dice. And it's kind of like, think of like Slay the Spire, but instead of getting a card, you have a dice. And like it has, obviously, they're all six-sided dice. So you can have like some dice that are like really powerful, but they have like really bad. One side maybe is really bad. And honestly, like the game's art is absolutely incredible. And I just cannot wait to gush about this game. But you may not have heard about it because they did something a little bit sneaky. I feel like it's very astral or very ethereal. The game obviously is called Astria Six-Sided Oracles. And they shadow dropped this game or shadow released it on the 21st night of September. Kind of like the Earth, Wind and Fire song. So it's, I just thought that was like so cool that they did that. I mean, I've been like patiently waiting for this game to come out. And then like the 21st night of September it released, I got like the Steam notification, like your item on your wish list is now available. And I was like, yes, let's go. (laughs) And it's really unique. That's a great feeling when you've been waiting for a game and then it actually ends up coming out sooner than you expected. Yeah. I mean, it didn't have like a release date at all. And I think that that's just like, I don't know. I think it's like just cosmic that it kind of happened, that it just kind of released like that. And if you don't mind looking up the art style. Oh, yeah. Um, I've been yeah. looking at it right now. I've, I've been looking at it this whole time. It looks really, really cool. I like all the dye. And, How would you describe this? I mean, I definitely see some like ancient Egyptian inspirations in there. I definitely see, oh. you know, some like Zodiac kind of inspiration in there. I, I see the artwork is interesting i'm really enjoying it yeah the art is really awesome and i guess just like just baseline like the story is there's basically some like corruption and the corruption is kind of like signified by red and there are oracles there are six oracles and those are the characters that you play as in this roguelite they all have different abilities and they're blue or signified in like blue and purple so i kind of just want to like run through a couple of them really quick like I've only unlocked the first three and I guess, so it's kind of different. Like instead of having like a health bar, you kind of have like a corruption meter, right? So imagine like a bar at the bottom of the screen and the bar has ticks in it, like segments, and that's your health. And like, if you get that, I guess that corruption bar all the way to zero, you lose a heart and each character has a specified amount of hearts. It's either two or three um, from what I've seen. And basically the dice either do corruption or they deal purity, which is the blue light. And it leads to some like some really cool creations because like, for example, there's one character and like one of their abilities is they use knowledge to purify like the corruptions. Like if let's say you have a dice, it's like a balanced dice and it has three sides that deal corruption and three sides that deal purity. You might want to put that in your deck if you're this person because you have this ability that can purify dice. If you can do that, I mean, basically it's, it's a dice that has, you know, that you can use all sides of. That's really cool. Yeah, it's really awesome. But also like you have different abilities on this, like this meter. So sometimes it might actually be beneficial for you to hurt yourself so that you can use the ability and that might like actually, you know, lead you to have a better outcome. 
So would you say this game is very like strategy? Oh, hundred like, percent. Like, really, you can't just like click away and get through it. No, yeah, you've really got to think, and it's kind of like Slay the Spire, and where you can like see how much damage the other person is going to deal to you, but then you can see like how much damage you can do. Yeah. But the majority of characters, like you have either a dice or an ability to where you can re-roll, and it's fairly easy to get that ability. So <laughs> it's kind of one of those things where it's like, I've actually found myself being like, okay, I'm going to re-roll this die. And if I don't like get a favorable outcome of this, like, you know, it's going to be this step, then this step. And like, it's really just like planning out like all these like different scenarios. And it's like, just the strategy of it is just so fun. And I actually remember the last run that I did, I spent like 20 minutes um, figuring out the strategy for my run or my turn and how to like maximize like the dice, like the damage per dice, like on this turn specifically. And I spent so much time like focusing on it. And I was like, all right, I maximized my dice. I did everything I could have done to like deal the most damage to like my opponent. And then I just like completely forgot to look at how much damage they were going to deal to me. And I got like wiped. <laughs> Yeah. But it's like one of those things where it's like if I had looked at that, I, I would have played like my whole strategy different. I would have like given myself some like buffs. I would have given myself like a shield. Right. And I just like didn't do that. And it's just insane. Like it's just so fun. There's so many possibilities. And it really kind of just like adds this like crazy extra layer of strategy and just like fun on top of it because you're truly rolling the dice. And there's some like crazy abilities. Like I said, the first character, so they kind of purify dice that's kind of like one of their i guess that's kind of like yeah i mean you can get like three or four different types of dice for each kind of character how many characters are there there's six but i've only unlocked the first three like i have to make it to like a certain level in each character before i unlock the next one i see so it's kind of like you basically have to like do a couple runs with one character before you unlock the next one and then I think that the last one you have to actually like complete the campaign in order to get the final person. I don't know that for sure, but the only reason that I'm thinking that is like when I talked to the publisher at PAX, I was asking him what his favorite character was. And he's like, I can't tell you. It's like the last one. I was like, oh man. He's like, well, can you like give me like any idea of like what kind of abilities they have? He's like, no, but it is sick. If you like these, you're going to really enjoy it. It's like, you have to kind of beat the campaign. I think, I mean, it may have changed since then. But I think that that's, that's just so cool. Anyway, so I guess back to the other characters. So I guess the one that's like purifies the dice, their, I guess, like iconography is like an owl. And everything in here is like animals. So like the corrupted animals that you're fighting, like once you kind of purify them, they kind of like turn into, I guess, like a more peaceful version of themselves, like which is really cool. Like, one of the first bosses you fight, this, like, very, like, mean, crazy-looking snapping turtle, and they've got, like, spikes coming out of their backs, and then once you purify them, they just turn into, like, a lesser, crazy version of, like, a snapping turtle that just looks more peaceful. So the second character is, is like, a hammerhead shark. Their dice are very much, like, deal, like, three or four damage to the opponent, but it, like, gives you, like, you take one or two damage. So it's kind of, like, very much, like, the toss and turn. I think it's kind of beautiful because it's kind of like a wave where it's kind of like you're dealing damage, but you're also receiving damage. And then they have a, I guess like one of the characteristics of a lot of their dice is called like tidal wave. And basically what you can do is if, let's say you're fighting three enemies and you apply tidal wave to the weakest enemy and you can kind of stack that tidal wave. Once you kill that enemy, it's like a tidal wave and it like ripples out. So like I had one match where... I had like tidal wave built up on a smaller enemy and it was like six or seven. And I was like, it doesn't matter. I just need to kill this person this turn because as soon as I kill them, I'll get like six or seven health and the enemies will get six or seven damage. It's really cool. And it makes it just so much fun. So tell me more about the people you're facing. So I know there are six characters, but are the enemies like villains that you're trying to get through? Like, yeah, so it's kind of just, like, corrupted animals. Like, a, a lot of times it's just, like, sea creatures. There's, like, squids and, I guess, like, snails and, like, other kinds of, um, I guess, like, cute sea creatures is pretty much all I've seen. I have only made it to the second boss. I don't know how many there are. I'm assuming there's, like, four or five stages. I'm not sure how many levels there are, but it's kind of like, like Slay the Spire in the way where you start off 
and you have like branching paths and then you can like choose to fight like an easy like a mini boss and then you can kind of go up and if you fight like a harder mini boss you can have options to like better i guess like rewards in the campaign and then you make it to a final boss and for that like section and then you move on to the next stage i'm looking at a photo of like a battle scene and i notice on the top left there's like a character named solarius the tide hammer and then there's like a little insignia next to it next to the character name do you know what that insignia signifies yeah so at the top there's like a like you can add like a bunch of boons so boons i'm sorry like boons how do you spell if you like are going through the campaign like you can stumble upon a random encounter for example and it's here actually let me see if i can pull some up boons so are they kind of just like added abilities yeah yeah kind of like added abilities like sometimes you'll get yeah yeah perks yeah in a way it's honestly an indie game and it's kind of hard to find information on this but yeah they're really honestly they're all very interesting and they can really give you some really creative i guess ways to play it but yeah what's up i have another question What's the luckiest moment you've had on this game? <laughs> I got really lucky and there's a way that you can like forge each side of a die. So like you basically get this currency as you defeat enemies and you can use this currency in a couple of different ways. You can use it to like buy sentinels is what they're called. And basically they're just like kind of like a robot. I guess like eight, it basically gives you like one extra dice and they yeah. are on either side of you. You can have up to two sentinels. And they each have, like, a passive ability as well as they have, like, a dice. Okay, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the photo, and I was wondering what those, like, floating things next to the main characters are. Mm Mm-hmm. Honestly, it's really crazy. I was... I'll come back to your question, but I was fighting one boss. Oh, my gosh. It was insane. The Sentinels had unlimited health. So, like, you couldn't kill them. Like, their health bar was the infinity. And, like, you would damage them. It would say, like, minus two, and it would be, like, full health, like infinity infinity health so like you really just had to focus on the main person yeah and they were kind of as basically what like the challenge was is like you have to kill the main guy (laughs) within a certain amount of turns before the sentinels get too powerful because basically they had a dice that it was like a carrot like it was like the damage and then it was like a carrot and every time they took a certain amount of i guess it's called corruption every time they got like hit with a certain amount of corruption So I guess I should clarify that there's only two ways, or there's only, I guess there's like red damage and blue damage. And like, let's say if the opponent does blue damage to you, it heals you. Let's say you have a dice that has like three corruption. You can either heal the opponent by three or you can deal three damage to you. So it's kind of like a yin and yang. Like it's like you can either deal damage or get health. And it's that signified by red and blue. So they were kind of dealing health to themselves and then they had like a a secondary meter on the bottom and every time they filled that up like every time they did like five health to themselves it's called like over corrupt or whatever and they over corrupted themselves and they got like another like their damage would go from like three to the power of two to three to the power of three interesting so instead of doing six damage they would do nine damage and so basically you had to like kill the main guy within a certain amount of turns or you would just be absolutely, you'd stand no chance. I was playing as, I guess the shark that had like, that does the tidal wave where he like deals a lot of damage to the opponent and deals damage to himself. Solarius the tide hammer. Hell yeah. They've got some really cool names too. (laughs) I was playing as him and I got this dice and it was, you know, let me see if I can find it. What was his name again? Solarius the tide hammer. Okay, I found it. (laughs) I'm sorry, that took so long. Okay. All right, so I got this one dice. So it has six sides, right? I think there are either three or two sides that are positive. And there are only two sides that are positive, but they deal two purification to any target for each time you've received corruption. So every time you've received damage, it's kind of like a multiplier. So it's basically two times X and it's like two times the amount of damage you've taken, which is like incredibly powerful because I mean, some of these matches can go on for like five or six minutes, right? So basically to give you an example, like one time I used this dice and I dealt like 17 damage and then I got it again at the end of the match and I was dealing like 
40 something damage. So like basically you run through your dice pool and then it like shuffles back in and you can do it again. But there's one side of the dice. So there's two sides that are like extremely powerful. And then there's three sides that are like, they deal damage to you. And then <laughs> there's one side that is, it permanently removes one of your, or it removes one of your hearts. So basically you can deal like a ton of damage or you could like lose a life. <laughs> <laughs> but I had basically like you can forge if you go to like a forge shop you can use like a honestly it's a lot of money so you really have to be you have to be very picky about this yeah. and you can really if you can forge a dice like you basically buy one side of a dice and you can put it onto any of your dice so you probably have like 10 to 20 dice depending on where you are in your run and you can basically spend all your money and like take one side and put it onto a dice. And I had done that two or three times on this dice. So I basically had, and I guess just to clarify, the one where you lose a life that had like a passive ability where you couldn't forge that away, like that was always gonna be there. And basically I had invested basically all of my money into this one single dice. It had given myself like crazy abilities on the other options because you can spend a lot of money and like they're worth it. And I basically, then I got to like the next forge and it was like, you can duplicate the dice. Like you can pay like a certain amount of money and duplicate the dice. So then I had these like two super powerful dice in my dice deck and I made it pretty far. And then I guess like throughout that run, I also got some like legendary dice as well, or like quote unquote, like legendary dice. And it was just like, it was just so much fun just to be able to like play this game and you truly have like a different experience every time. And I mean, you'll figure out kind of like what, I guess, abilities work better for you and whatnot. But it was honestly just so fun. And the art style is just gorgeous. So I can't recommend this one enough. How many hours overall would you say you've put in so far? Well, let me check my Steam clock here. I have put almost 10 hours in two weeks into it. Okay. That's a good chunk. <laughs> Which is a lot. But I mean, honestly, like I can pick this game up do like a single battle in like 20 minutes and then set it aside. And I'm probably going to honestly start another run tonight because I've been talking about it and it's, I just want to play it. <laughs> but I mean, like if you like Slay the Spire, like there's not a ton of games out there like it. And these deck building like roguelikes that, that are competent and that are really fun. So I would absolutely recommend this one. And I actually kind of, I think that I, after playing it, I, I honestly, honestly think I like it better than Slay the Spire. I mean, if just the art style alone, I think it's really fun. And you kind of just are constantly, you know, just trying to like weigh your options. Like, can you stack the odds in your favor? And like, you have to choose between, like you constantly have to choose between healing the enemy and hurting yourself. And it's kind of like having to choose that is really interesting because there are some battles where like you have to end it fast and there are some battles where like you can take your time if you don't want to hurt yourself but sometimes it's in your best interest to hurt yourself which is i think really interesting and i really like that i guess just to also clarify the abilities that like each character has like certain abilities the abilities that are more powerful are closer to the zero on your health bar so if you like deal a lot of damage to yourself, like you have like you can have like a wicked effective turn and deal a lot of damage, but it's also at great risk. So what's the risk again? Like those larger abilities? Yeah, so the larger abilities are at the end of your health bar or like your corruption meter. So like if you deal a lot of damage to yourself, you can have access to more abilities, but at the risk of having lesser health. So it's really like honestly like just judging the risk reward and just like the odds like i think it's just so fun and fascinating and it's a great game why do you think it's doing so well in other markets and not in the u.s i guess it wasn't necessarily made by an english developer i think the studio that made it is out of portugal and hey, let me see if i can find anything on the publisher i think it's an international publishing house for games and i mean it's kind of like more like an international devolver, but like on like a really smaller scale. But I mean, it's also, I think it's just like this year has been in incredibly stacked with AAA releases. And this is honestly like, it's kind of like a sleeper indie hit 
I mean, I don't even know if it's a hit, you know? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I haven't really heard hardly anybody talking about it. And I, I wouldn't have known about it if I hadn't gone to PAX. So I think it's honestly, I think it's just an indie game and it doesn't have as much exposure here. I guess PC Gamer and IGN gave it reviews. I guess I'll just see what they did. PC Gamer gave it an 80 and IGN said they're not rating it. <laughs> I guess that means it's not big enough for them to review. Damn. It has an 85 on Metacritic. That's pretty good. Which is based on six reviews. Wow. They're all very positive. The first one is 95, a 90, 88, 85. PC Gamer, it looks like, is the lowest. And there's another one that's 80 as well. So there's two 80s, an 85, an 88, a 90, and a 95. Very positive. I mean, but there's only six reviews. Honestly, I love this game. I think it's incredible. Okay. So the developer is called Little Leo Games, and the publisher is Akupara. Akupara Games. That sounds familiar. They've honestly got a really cool logo. It's kind of like a tree growing out of the back of a tortoise. Here, Akupara Games. They published a VR game called Behind the Frame. That's and awesome. And... They're publishing another game called Universe for Sale. And let's see what we can find out about Little Leo Games. Yeah, there's not much on Little Leo Games either. They have a Twitter profile. And, okay, actually, I was wrong that they were out of Portugal. I apologize. They're an indie developer studio based out of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And, man, I think this game is awesome. Oh, my gosh. sounds like it. (laughs) I went to, (laughs) if you've been following uh, the news of Twitter recently, it's not necessarily called Twitter anymore, but I'm on like, it says twitter.com slash little Leo games. And it's like the website is like flashing in and out of existence. (laughs) Oh, that's very funny. But it looks like they have a couple other games that they worked on on their itch.io page. If you'd like to check that out. Yes. Astria six sided oracles. I mean, this game rules. And honestly, I'm just so ecstatic that it's here and that I'm having a great time playing it. Man, so fun. Just so fun. I guess I should say that I played the demo. Like, I played the demo until they wouldn't let me play it anymore. And the demo was just like the first area. So basically, I was just like running like the first area over and over again, like the same characters. But man, so fun. But I guess before we move on to our next games, I have a little topic for you, Brandon. And I guess eagle-eared <laughs> listeners will know that you recently got an Xbox and you've yeah. had a PlayStation and you got Xbox to play Starfield. And I wanted to know, I guess, well, one, I wanted to know if you regret that decision at all. But I also kind of want to know, like, what's the experience like on Xbox these days? Like, how different does it feel from PlayStation when, I guess, you, when you log into it? Have you noticed anything or... What's the experience been like? Yeah, do you regret it? Like, what's it like versus PlayStation? Like, what are your observations? Honestly, I haven't been able to really, like, play too many games on it for me to give, like, a solid response on it. Like, I played Diablo 4 on it. I've played Starfield. I've played... That's really about it. Like, the the extent of, like, actually playing a game for... Mm-hmm. more than 10 hours and it's ran pretty smoothly you know i think for the price i paid for it i got the series s it was 250 you know i have access to that whole catalog of games it's really cool so i really do feel like it's just an extension to my my playstation and my gaming setup that i'm grateful to have i played halo as well can't forget playing a lot of Halo. I played Halo on the Steam Deck. I mean, I guess we haven't really talked about it since you've played it. Yeah. How did you like that experience? It was really fun. It was really fun to just go back in time, you know, and enjoy Mm -hmm. Halo again. And that's really why I bought the Xbox was because, you know, a lot of my first gaming memories were made on my Xbox 360. So it's just kind of like the user interface I'm used to. I'm used to a lot of the titles that are like Xbox exclusives. So it feels good to have access to that again. Would you say it feels familiar? It definitely does feel familiar. I just wish I had more time to like check out different Xbox titles and Xbox exclusives. 
because there's a lot of them mm-hmm. and that game pass is really really cool too like I, did you get game pass no i did i just got the xbox live gold which I, I think now is actually game pass but like just like the basic subscription mm-hmm. and it works pretty well for me i mean starfield is single player so i think i uninstalled halo just for the time being mm-hmm. did it keep you like interested because I guess for me, I really enjoyed playing the Halo when it first came out, and I, I thought it was really fun. But it kind of just didn't hold my attention. I was kind of just like, yeah, this is great. This feels like it did, but I don't know if that was enough for me to keep wanting to play. No, I hear you. It definitely, you know, it's fun, but it's like there's only so much Halo you could play by yourself. There's mm-hmm. only so much Halo fun you could have by yourself. So, you know, maybe we, we should hop on a game. Yeah, we should. And run some fire team, dude. That's, you know, if Halo is way more fun. I'll install it right now. <laughs> and yeah, dude, that's one hell of a game, man. When Halo came out, it really changed up the industry. The, the first person shooting industry. Yeah. Do, I mean, do you feel like, like, is your experience dictated by nostalgia? Or are you enjoying what's new there? You know, I think my experience is dictated by nostalgia in this case. As far as, like, what's new, there isn't really anything that stands out to me. Especially, you know, when you start to look at the PlayStation and, you know, the PS5 and the different features there are there. There's really nothing that this could do that the PS5 could do. And, like, Mm -hmm. even further, there's really nothing that the Series S could do that the Xbox 360 couldn't do, so to say. (laughs) <laughs> I would just say, like, the bigger difference would just be graphics. Yeah. Let me ask a more specific question then. Because I guess for me, when I log on to the PlayStation, it drives me nuts that I see, like, ads at the bottom. And I know that, like, they say they're, like, notifications. But, like, so often it's about games that I have absolutely no interest in playing, no interest in buying. Like, it's the latest thing that PlayStation feels like is pushing on to me. Do you feel that with Xbox games? Like, is that something that you see immediately when you turn on the Xbox? Because I feel like that's, like, the PlayStation's greatest sin, in my opinion. You know, you do see ads. As soon as you pop up your console, there are ads on that home screen, you know, discounts and and all sorts of stuff. It's something that, like, in the world we live in, it's just all these corporations, everyone's vying for attention, you know? Yeah. Before starting up here, we were just talking about, like, kind of how to get our podcast, you know, in a different light and and garner some different kind of attention that means more to us. So it seems like in a world where, like, attention is currency, you know, we have all these advertisers just trying to get a piece of it. It's so rampant in our consoles. Like, as soon as we open it, we have all these publishers trying to pitch their games at us, all these app developers... Trying to sauce their apps, and it definitely takes away from the heart of gaming. Yeah, there's a lot of noise in the peripherals around it. And I guess just to kind of bring the conversation we were having off air onto air, I mean, I personally, I've been feeling like there are just so many games. There's just no way I can play them all, especially the games that I'm interested in. Like, I've been so excited for Astria's Six Sided Oracles. Like, I mean, I brought it up multiple times before it even released. And like there was a moment of hesitation where I was like, if I play this, that means I can't play the myriad of other games. And it came out 21st night of September. Like I was still, I mean, I still am very much enjoying Starfield, but like that's kind of the main game that I'm playing. So I'm like, this is going to take a side seat. And I just think that it's just been crazy. The amount of games that have come out this year. So it's, I don't know, me personally, I'm just feeling a little, like, overwhelmed with how to make time for it all. I think crazy is an understatement, you know, it's like, it's insane the amount of games that get released in a year, it just, I think it speaks to kind of the demand that there are for games, that the supply is there, but I'm not sure if these products that are being developed in the games ever get, like, fully experienced I'm saying, like, if these people who are buying them are not really completing the games, they're kind of just buying them. As far as, like, just the market hype, like, that's, it's happened to me in the past six months with, like, even Starfield is, like, one of those, like, market hype games. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I think they've done a lot of research on the amount of players that buy a game versus the amount of players that finish. And I think it's roughly around 10% that finish a game. So I, I think it's it's very low. I mean, I can you know only speak for myself. I think I've only finished two or three games this year. That's and, right. I think that yeah. that also speaks to like the, a bigger problem we have, especially like here in America, as far as like consumer culture. Mm-hmm. And it's like we want to just buy the new game, you know, where you have this obsession with new, and you know, you want to have yeah. the new car every year. You want to have the new iPhone, and it's like we're doing a real number on the environment, you know, looking more closely at the video game industry, all the discs that get produced to make all these new games and all the paper that has to be used to like market all these things. And, you know, that- yeah. I mean, it's also, you know, the energy costs as well, you know I mean? To run the high end PCs and the energy cost of you downloading a game is substantial. Actually, I think something came out this week about when there's an indie developer that like published how much their like their carbon footprint was. Let me see if I can find that. That's really cool, and like that's something I do think about, especially as like I try. One of my core values is you know not to make unnecessary harm. Gaming definitely rubs up against that value a lot. I mean, you do have one console and it like runs you for a long time, but then like when you get rid of that console, where does it go? Like how do you properly dispose of that console and like you were saying too like the energy costs like we run these consoles all day every day Mm -hmm. yeah here if you don't mind i was able to find something really quick this is from isp.page which i guess i don't know if we've ever really read anything from the internet on the show before but i mean i think it's very relevant um and and it's you know it's actually came out two days ago um it's this report that i'm reading so it says i guess the the headline is The gaming industry's carbon footprint revealed a call for sustainable practices. And this is written by Adam Wixie and Gregory Adam Wixie from isp.page slash news. A recent report by Dr. Benjamin Abraham, a digital games researcher and founder of After Climate, has shed light on the extensive carbon footprint of the games industry. While video games provide instant fun and entertainment, the industry has been slow to acknowledge the environmental impact of game development and gameplay. According to Abrams' estimates, the gaming industry generates carbon emissions capable or comparable to the global film industry, amounting over 81 million tons of CO2 in 2022. This carbon footprint includes emissions from video games and big tech companies involved in the industry. In fact, the emissions produced by the gaming industry surpasses the emissions of many small countries. Notably, the report highlights that only a few gaming companies have made progress in reducing their carbon footprint. Out of 34 large game companies, only three were able to decrease their emission in 2022. And that was Tencent, Apple, and Nintendo. All right, I'm going to read the next paragraph because I think it's kind of interesting and then we can move on. However, the report also reveals a more concerning issue. Most gaming companies do not disclose their Scope 3 emissions, particularly those related to the use of gaming devices by consumers. Scope 3 emissions account for a significant portion of the industry's overall emission, ranging from 10 to 90%. For instance, gamers in the United States alone emit 24 million tons of CO2 per year. And that was just about half the article, so please go check that out. It's called isp.page slash news slash how much carbon. Yeah, Mr. Wixie might want to watch his back because EA is coming for him. EA, <laughs> EA doesn't like that article. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's crazy the amount of the environmental impact on running computers and you know just the heat generated by yeah i mean because at the end of the day the consoles are computers so i think about like the servers that are put like in the bottom of the ocean that disrupt marine Mm. ecosystems and it's like this is all just so we can like enjoy playing these games and it's like i know there's a solution if we were just a bit more aware as consumers we can like meet the producers halfway and kind of figure out a better way to do this that doesn't really harm the planet as much 
I mean, it would make it yeah, a lot more absolutely. But we could figure it out. I think absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot to be said there. I mean, obviously, like you know, these large companies and corporations that you know have all these huge emissions. Like, obviously, a lot of it is on them to you know find ways to reduce those costs, and they are producing negative externalities on all of us. But yeah, I mean, we also have a responsibility as global citizens, you know, to do better and I guess be more mindful and. You know, something I do want to touch on that you kind of brought up was, you know, as consumers, we were just so focused on buying the new thing, the new game. And I feel like it's just not sustainable. And I think you mentioned that last week. And I guess that's, I don't know, just something that's top of mind for both me and Brandon right now. It's just like, how do we play these games and love the industry while also, you know, being mindful of that? I, I mean, I don't have all the answers, but it's, it's you know, thinking about it is, is half the battle. Yeah, I hate to bring up a problem and not have a solution, but it's just, yeah, it's really something that's been top of mind for us recently. And we just really want to take a step off of the, you know, hedonic treadmill mm-hmm. and just really enjoy this platform that we love, right? And, and that's gaming. Yeah, absolutely. So. And I guess just something that I guess worth talking about is, you know, Brandon and I, we met working at Patagonia and... One of their you know, their taglines, um, I guess, is it their ethos or their the company statement is not bound by convention. So, I don't know. I feel like we should bring a little bit of that as we play games. Like, how can we game and not be bound by the convention of the continual release cycle? Yeah, it definitely is a new frontier in this world where we're living in, you know, where we kind of have people who whose interests align with let's just keep producing new games every single quarter and have people you know just play games for months at a time never complete them and then you know people who just want to actually enjoy games and actually explore the media like appreciate the amount of hours that went into creating these things right like i just think about it from like a physics perspective like these people these really smart people all came together and poured hours into creating this for us. And then we only play it for like a fraction of the amount of time that they spent into it. That just seems inherently wrong to me. Yeah. I feel like that haunts me. Like, I feel like there's gotta be like something out there. And like, if I had seen this or if I had played a little bit more of this game, like maybe it would have changed my life. But I guess there's, yeah, something I did want to just, I guess, touch on is I feel like, you know, like, especially from what we've learned over the course of our journey here at the Sticky Buttons podcast, like from what we've learned about game development, and I guess it should be said, Brandon and I, we're, we're not developers, but we've gone out of our way to do research on as much as we can. And it seems that, you know, people that, that make games, I mean, they have a love for it. They have a love for a medium just like us. And I think that the, you know, the decisions to rush a deadline or to put a game out for a fiscal quarter is... is you know, something that's not made by the people that made the games. And I just wanted to recognize that in, in light of this conversation. I'm not pointing a finger at anyone, but just acknowledging that that's probably not on the developers and the creators' shoulders. Yeah, at the end of the day, there's a board, there's a bottom line that, you know, they have to adhere to. Yeah, absolutely. Well, on a more positive note, <laughs> I've got another game <laughs> that I wanted to bring up today. <laughs> It came out, I think, in 2019. I think it came to PC and to Switch. And I, I had it on my wish list for a long time. And I got it on sale. And I've really, really been enjoying it. And this game is called Islets. Have you heard of Islets? Islets? I have not heard of it. But it sounds really cool. You should absolutely okay, look up the art. art style of this. It got a 10 yeah. out of 10 on Steam. Wow. Yes, this game is really awesome. So it's, I guess, it's a Metroidvania. And I picked this up. Simply just because of the way the main character looks. They look like very cute and derpy. And they're kind of like a mouse character. But they've got like a blue tunic. And they like swing a sword. And something that is not really, I guess, conveyed in the trailers. I mean, I think you might be able to see it in the trailers. But there's an attack animation where like the main character swings a sword. I'm seeing the animation. It looks really, really cool. If you look at that, hit the eye on the character, it's like as the animation is going through, it's like the eye like kind of widens and then it like kind of like squishes and it makes the character look like really derpy. Do you see that in the yeah. trailer? 
it's really funny and it happens every time and it just like cracks me up like every time i swing the sword like it feels like the, the character's eyes bulge and it is just so funny but it is just like so slick and so snappy and it's just like playing it it's just so satisfying just like the tactile way that it feels like when you hit the input and like the action happens like oh my gosh like, it is awesome these villains look kind of scary yeah, the villains are, they are a little bit scary. And I guess that I kind of wanted to talk about this game and kind of compare it to Hollow Knight. And I could not get into Hollow Knight. I guess if you know me, I just don't fuck with bugs, man. So, so I just really couldn't get into Hollow Knight. And also like Hollow Knight is very, at least at the beginning, it's very dark and it's very contrast with the characters, like the head being white and just like, it's a very dark setting. And in in this game, Islets, it's very bright and there's a lot of color and a lot of light. And there are some dark places to it. There are some dark atmospheres, but I just, I don't know. It's not quite the same as as Hollow Knight because there's so much color and everybody looks so derpy. It's really funny. (laughs) And I did kind of just want to, I mean, I don't really have too much more to say other than, you know, I think the game is just like very fun and snappy. The combat is awesome. And I think that the sound design is incredible. I really just love the way it feels when you roll, swing a sword, shoot your bow, land a jump, like jump and then hit an enemy and they kind of like wheeze in a way. I just really enjoy it. (laughs) I think it's awesome. It's attention to detail, man, the little things we really appreciate. Yeah, yeah, I guess one more thing before we move on. I was kind of, uh, it has like a lot of quirkiness to it and it's very charming. Like I was exploring one area of the game and honestly, I guess we've talked about this every now and again, but like I like it when narratively, like mechanics in the game make sense or elements of a game make sense based on the narrative. And this is like a Metroidvania. There's like, you kind of have to discover these very labyrinthian like map sections And basically the lore is that there used to be this like super continent in the sky and then they split up after an event and now there's like six islands and you're kind of trying to connect all the islands again. So each island is its own map and you kind of travel to each one of them. And I was exploring one of the islands and I kind of come across this NPC and it's like, hey, we're giving tours of the tombs and the crypts down south of here like follow this way if you'd like to join this free tour oh you looks like you're a tourist in this area how about you follow me and he's like this way (laughs) and he kind of like leads you through the map and you're kind of following him and he's like oh wow i had got to take this call how about you go check out this beautiful vista over here and you're kind of like this is a little fishy is because there's like tombstones and there's like all these visual elements saying like it's very creepy this way, but he's like, oh, it's beautiful. And he kind of like goes the other way. And then you go in and it's like this like crazy boss fight. <laughs> and I just thought that was awesome. That is really cool. It's always fun to be surprised by the developers. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was really goofy. And then on the other side, he's like, oh, you made it through. Wow. Please fill out this survey. and <laughs> Tell us about your experience. I definitely won't try and lead you down to sacrifice you to another boss later in the game. Which I don't know if they will, but <laughs> they I thought that will. was funny. I wouldn't put it past them at this point. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I just thought that was really funny and I really enjoyed that. So definitely check out Islets. It's a really fun Metroidvania. And I honestly, I've been having a blast with it. I think I'd like to, I don't know how far I am like in terms of percentage completion, but every time I've gotten in, I've really just enjoyed the experience. So Lots of indie games for you. That's what this Steam Deck will give you access to. Lots of different indie titles that you might not otherwise play. Yeah, and that's one of the, the main reasons that I wanted to get the Steam Deck. is just so I have access to you know Steam and games that come to Steam. And I honestly am very happy that I picked this up. I guess it is worth noting that Islets is on Switch. But originally it just came out on PC and then it came to Switch much later, so... Had this been a new game, I would have been able to play this exclusive on PC, I suppose. But have you been playing any 2K recently? I was playing some 2K last night. I was playing some Texas. I got more of my friends to get on Texas Chainsaw Massacre. 
Yeah, is that a, is that a good spooky game still? It's a great game for October, man. And I still <laughs> haven't figured out how to escape. Oh, you haven't done it yet? You haven't escaped? I still have not escaped, dude. It's rough. I just don't want to have to, like, watch a video on, like, tips and tricks. Nah, you can finish it. You can figure it out. But yeah, I know. I just need to get my team together. Get my friends up to speed on kind of just how to play. But I've been mm-hmm. having a great time, dude. It's really just one of those games that gets your heart beating. You know, you turn off the lights, you put on your headset, and you're in it. It's really, really <laughs> fun. Oh, that's awesome. So, yeah, probably going to run a couple of those matches later tonight. And then, what else have I been playing? I haven't gotten a chance to get on our server. Oh, the Minecraft like, server? Yeah, something I've been longing to do. Yeah, I, I haven't really had a chance to get on that in like a week or two either, but... The last time I was in, I made a boat, so I'm about to get out of this area because I just died so many times in the night. <laughs> yeah. No, that's fair, right. Especially the spawn area is right by a jungle. When jungles get active, there's a lot of creatures and stuff. There's a lot of resources, so. Overall, I think it's a really good area to start. And hey, if you'd like to join us in our Minecraft realm, you can support us on Patreon. And uh, you'll get access to our Minecraft realm. And you can do that for as little as $1. And you can hop in and play some Minecraft with us. I guess the only thing that I wanted to talk about before we end up today is... I guess every fall, I feel a little bit... I guess a little pang of nostalgia. Just like the drive to play some comfier and cozier games. And I always end up picking up my DS. And I've been playing some Pokemon Heart Gold... Uh, that's a great fall game, dude. Yeah, it is is very autumnal. There's a lot of orange colors. And I have not caught ho yet. And that's something that I did this past week. I caught ho No way. I, yeah. That was really, honestly, that was really awesome. Proud of you. The way that it, yeah, that it kind of led up to this. And also, I was very proud because my team, I've actually been very selective about, like, my team members and, like, what kind of moves, and I've really been trying to branch out this playthrough and give give myself, I guess not necessarily, like I normally, when I play, I go for like a really like attack heavy and like special attack heavy builds, but I'm really trying to go for like status effects and like weird combos this time around, and my team was like 10 levels underneath ho when I was able to capture it. Just because you took that kind of different approach. Yeah, I was able to, like, put it to sleep, like, confuse it, and... That's awesome. I love to hear that, just trying out different approaches to playing the game. So I'm on my way to the league right now, so maybe we'll we'll see how I do there. That's really um, excited. You saw the cutscene for ho What did you think about that? I guess, like, the cutscene before you start the battle? Yeah, and isn't there one after, too? I guess I don't remember. I guess it didn't make that much of an impact on me, but... You were probably just so stoked. You just wanted to see the Pokédex <laughs> registration. <laughs> I really was, man. I really was. I was really having such a good time. And I guess this made it onto my Games of the Year for last year. And I think, you know, at the beginning of this year, I guess Pokémon Scarlet and Violet came out and they really just didn't do it for me. It was really... Yeah. I think we've talked about it. The it last really kinda... two games, dude, Arceus and Scarlet and Violet, it's like, again, like the marketing is there. The marketing team is doing their thing, but I don't think the development team is, like, our true Pokemon diehard fans. Because if they were, they would give us an experience of a lifetime, and they're just not doing that. Well, actually, I think some... Now, it's really hard to get, I guess, like, news just because the Pokemon company and Nintendo are so secretive. But I think there's been a lot of reporting that came out that they didn't have a choice and that they had to ship the game based on... Like, they had already, like, printed the cards for it. I guess it's all, like, rumors, but I guess that... I don't know. I kind of feel like there's not as much of an excuse because I kind of followed along with the DLC, and I was expecting there to be a performance patch, and there just wasn't. And a lot of people said when the DLC came out that it ran just as bad as it, as poorly as it did. And Yeah. I, <laughs> do you know that quote where it's like, if you live long enough, I think it's from like a Batman movie or something where it's like, if you live long enough, you see yourself become the villain. Yeah. I feel like for me, it's like, if you live long enough, you see yourself become a disgruntled Pokemon fan. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I certainly have. Been. I definitely see that. Yeah, because it's just, 
it's just you get you play so much of it you play so many different iterations and like obviously some teams are going to do it better than other teams you know as far as like creating the game and like executing this experience that we all know and love like emerald there's really nothing that kind of tops that experience for me and i know that it's not just because that was really my first experience with the franchise like i know that the hoenn region is one of the main region one of the regions where you can actually dive as much as you can and explore that facet of the world so for me it was very like it was very fascinating to be able to not only walk around this kind of 2d surface but now also explore this surface under under the water this whole new world not to mention the caves the cave systems in the hoenn region are pretty extensive so I was really fascinated with the Hoenn region, and then right after that, we have the Shino region, which is, you know, get me wrong, I, the Shino region is actually one of the better ones, but compared mm-hmm. to Hoenn, I just, I think they kind of skimped us a bit, and that's just... Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I guess I'm somebody that I put like 700, or well, very close to 700 hours into like Pokemon Sword and Shield after not playing since like Pokemon Platinum. But I really, after kind of looking back, like I really honestly, I had no nostalgia for the DS game, the Heart Gold Soul Silver. I had never played them. And I really do kind of feel like just looking back and kind of experiencing these and playing them that I feel like the games lost a lot of their charm when they went from 2D to 3D. And I guess for me, it kind of just begs the question of why. Like, Why did we make this? To me, it seems like an unnecessary jump. I mean, like, I'm still playing a game that I've talked about many times, like, Eastward. And it's a top-down pixel art game. I just love, like, that art style, and I love, like, the way that the world is translated from the isometric view. Like, you can do so much with that. And I think, like, the remakes of Diamond and Pearl, like, it really, I don't know, for me, I'm just like, I want to return to that, like, isometric pixel art kind of game i do really like the chibi art style of, of diamond yeah. pearl so i guess that's not as important but the top down that's something 2D. we've talked about more than once on the podcast just kind of like why yeah why did they make that switch over and i, I mean it doesn't only happen with nintendo i mean you see it like disney movies i mean not disney movies sorry i mean even disney like with pixar like pixar movies used to be like absolute bomb and then after a certain point, they kind of just, like, started falling off, and they aren't as, you know, magnanimous as they used to be. And at least in Disney's case, I know it has something to do with BlackRock and, like, (laughs) investing. Basically have to make changes so they get investment. And, I mean, even in Nintendo's case, it's probably the same thing. And even, like, a publisher like EA, it's like, you get to a certain amount of money, you're seeing a certain amount of, like, margins... Mm -hmm. And you're doing business with people like BlackRock. Like, you want to, like, make sure you maintain those relationships so you make decisions accordingly. Whereas, like, you're not as true to, like, who you were and what got you there, so to say. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. I honestly, I cannot, I won't be able to, I guess, cite myself. I have no idea where this was. But if, I mean, you could probably find this on the internet if you looked there was a, I guess, a story that came out a couple of weeks ago, and there was a indie publisher or an indie game developer, and they talked about their trials and tribulations of getting funding. And one of the reasons that they struggled to get funding is they said, we have this timeline and we want to make this, like, it's this timeline, this amount of money. And they were like, oh, I'm sorry, we're not looking to invest less than a hundred million or whatever. And they're like, what are you talking about? Like this, this game is going to have, you know, X margin, but it's just not at that level. And I think that that is very interesting that, that like they were not able to get funding because it wasn't of a certain scope and scale. And they were like, that doesn't like, that shouldn't dictate the creative vision. Like, I think that that's very interesting that I guess it's something to be mindful of. Like there's, you know, I guess this, I don't know this like return can only ever like it's just not sustainable to have like year over year like the highest return ever followed by the next highest return ever and I think 2022 is one of the best years commercially for the games industry they they had record profits I just think it's very weird because it's like that was based on a set of circumstances you know in the macro environment 
Like that is it just enable like in order for you to have those, you know, record profits, it's never going to be sustainable. And I think that it's it's just really sad that there's just been so many layoffs in the industry. I feel like I'm not articulating this very well, but I'm following what you're saying. And I think like egging off of what you're saying that I think the layoffs are happening because of that, because yeah. companies want to say like year over year on paper, they want to be able to say like, look, we're doing great numbers. You know, they want to be able to go tell the board like, Hey, we sold more than we sold last year. And our fans are, you know, loving X, Y, Z, like they're buying on our, our store more VC than ever. And so yeah. to the board, things look great, but like to the fans, the people who really support these businesses and kind of lifted them up to this point, they kind of feel betrayed, you know? And I mean, I feel that way of Pokemon, you know, bringing it back to Pokemon. I do really feel like for a second there, they were making really, really good games. And then they just kind of like went on a tangent, you know, and, haven't gone back since. Yeah, I guess this is just speculation, but I wonder if it is. It seems that the release timeline was very much, you know, shrunk down. I think there is a like a very large gap between like some of the earlier games, or it's like a couple like there's a couple year difference. And I think like last year, yeah, they released like the Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl remakes, like Legends Arceus and Scarlet and Vila within like the span of like a year. Yeah, yeah the classic that. like quality over quantity kind of like yeah I, yeah very odd and also i think like with the 3d versus 2d medium the 3d medium is more forgiving as in you don't have to be more creative from a gameplay design perspective like something i really liked you said was like the charm that the 2d games had and like mm-hmm. you know the medium is a little different and the designers understand that and so they have to be very creative and innovative and genius and come come up with different ways to really grab on to the player's attention whereas with because the, there's it's some of it's subjective it's left yeah, up to your imagination right and with the 3d it's more so like oh, we can just like make pikachu have a really cute animation when he comes out of the pokeball and that'll keep fans and it's like you know like that's awesome we love that but that's not why we're here today we're not here today because the pokemon has a nice animation when he gets out the pokeball you know, we're here today because Pokemon's really fun. It's a really fun adventure game. And, you know, you just you love being able to catch them all and you know, tell these really cool stories about you know, how you went about it. So, Yeah, absolutely. And I guess there's one point that I want to make on that. Like, as I said, I'm somebody that put a lot of time into Pokemon Sword and Shield. But, like, if you look at the map, it is a straight line. Like, you go from the bottom to the top it is a line like the map of Galar is, is very linear from point a to point yeah. b and yeah they, they did something really innovative in the wild area which you know led to pokemon legends arceus which led to yeah. scarlet and violet but in you know the original or i guess some of the earlier entries i mean it kind of was like a labyrinth like you there were a lot of times where you may not have known where to go and you had to retrace yeah. your steps it really did feel like an adventure it's like you didn't know you got lost in the region and you had to like figure out your way through. Yeah, absolutely. And I do kind of also want to say that like, I guess kind of just going off of this, I, like I said, I never really played, you know, these earlier entries. Like I never played heart gold. I never played the original like gold, silver crystal. And I've also picked that up too. And I've got to say, man, I am really struggling. Like it is really hard. And I know that like, you know, people played these and they were able to play them, you know, I mean, obviously they're an RPG of their time, but they are very challenging. And I think that that is something that I was surprised by. Um, I somebody that just absolutely loves like the newer titles. I mean, well, some of them, but has played a lot of them. I'm just like gobsmacked by the difficulty. Like I am grinding, like I'm EV training right now, which I've never had to do. Yeah. I've never done that. Like I'm literally EV training my team. I guess it's worth <laughs> worth noting I'm EV training them against Drowsy, which is yeah. a huge like special defense and defense stats. Yeah. So I'm really trying to like boost my <laughs> the defensive stats of my team. That's what I was thinking is like in those old school games, like how would they, from a design perspective, how would they reward or incentivize training? And that would be making the trainers that you fight really, really difficult, just as good as you 
So now you have to like take your training to the next level to be able to hold your own in those battles. And in the newer games, you know, like Pokemon Shield, Sword and Shield, for example, I didn't have to do that. I could just like battle trainers and I'd be fine. Like didn't matter, you know, it wasn't a worry. Yeah, for me, something that I thought was really interesting was I really enjoyed like the raid battles, which I honestly, I think that those are, for me personally, I think that's a very welcome addition. I really like, I don't know, I guess the kind of like multiplayer, like just jump into like a, a random match kind of thing for Pokemon. I really think that that brings the franchise into the future, but you get a ton of like rewards for that and in their in the form of candies and if you feed those to your pokemon they get like xp yeah and i remember like doing that and i was like oh like i'm like 10 levels above everybody and then i was like my pokemon just aren't listening to me even though i've been raising them from you know the get-go just because like and that presented its own unique challenges but like i ended up being able to push through because my, my Pokemon were so well leveled. Yeah, and even that doesn't make for a fun experience. Like when you're just no. zooming through every trainer, it feels kind of unfair. Like you battle a gym battle and it's not even hard. Like that's not. Mm-hmm. There's a balance to it, and and that balance definitely kind of got lost as they're trying to. It feels like they're just trying to cater to to newer players who aren't as experienced. But I think maybe what Pokemon could consider doing, you know, just to give a solution, could be dropping like an advanced edition or like a more like an edition of the game that's like for more experienced players or maybe like yeah a variation of the region that's a little more difficult yeah i mean we've talked about this before but i feel like just if they made like difficulty options like if there was a way that like i could have to be like let's just say at default it is you know as easy as it is and then, you know, but like if you want uh, like a more older school experience, you could like go into the menus and select a hard mode or adult mode or, or something and or whatever they decide to call it. That's just a little bit more of a challenge. That'd be cool. Experience. Like bring it back, like maybe like retro mode and like pixel yeah. a little bit. Like maybe Ooh, it'd be cool like if that. you could just like you had your 3D game, right? You dropped mm-hmm. your whatever you want to drop Nintendo, but then you could just like make a mode where you could flip it to 2D. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, kind of like the dragon quest echoes of Mobile yes Stage. yes or 11 exactly 11. exactly if you had that mode because that's kind of what they were going for they understood the nostalgia they understood the franchise and their people why they were coming back and pokemon definitely understands that but i think they just have so much market share that they just don't care you know they don't really have yeah to. i would really like to see like like another team do it better and just like i would love like an indie team to like Make oh, like man. their legal team is so extensive they'd be yeah. all over that right away because that really threatens what they do over there at pokemon international company um, but i guess that's just to say that you know competition breeds a better game so <laughs> it does shout outs uh, to capitalism <laughs> I, I don't know if i can sign off on that I- <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's talk about another game, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but here, do you mind if I tell you my team for Pokemon Gold? And then I guess I can show you the Heart Gold as well. But I am playing Gold on a Game Boy Color. Oh, I've shit. got this, this purple Game Boy Color. and I, I Here I was thinking you were playing Gold on like a DS, like the DS version. Yeah, I've been playing that one as well. Okay. So I've actually, I live very close to a park and I've been taking both of these out into the park and I've just been having an absolute blast. So here, let me see what have I got here. So I guess for the record, the one where I'm EV training, this is original gold. I am 12 hours in. I have two badges, which is not a lot for the amount of time. I have a level 17 Togepi and I'm basically, I'm trying to get all these Pokemon up to like 19. That's kind of where I'm going. Just because I want to have the like the special defense and I want to be able to like keep going through the game. I've got a Togepi, a Slowpoke, and a Kadabra. And those are all level 17. Those are also um, really I'm, badass final evolutions right there. Yeah, I've been very selective with my team. And I have a level 19 Bay Leaf and a level 17 Butterfree. And I have a Ditto on my team right now, but I'm not gonna they're just the sixth slot. 
Yeah. So I'm thinking, I don't know what Pokemon I'm going to fill up, but I think I might take Butterfree off my team. But the thing is, I've never had a Butterfree on my team before, Brandon. They're so good. I mean, the Butterfree is just like unreal good. Right now, this Butterfree knows, it knows Harden, which I guess they would all know Harden. But like in the early games, like, like if you can use Harden two or three times, like it truly makes like a huge difference. Yeah, you're not getting knocked off. It knows confusion, poison powder, and sleep powder. Yeah, and that Butterfree's a weapon. I'd hate to battle you. <laughs> yeah, this Butterfree is just outrageous. And I I don't even know what to say. I can't I mean I've always been sleeping on Butterfree. And I guess maybe I I wanna take them off my team because I I don't love bugs, but hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually I mean I feel like a butterfly, I feel like that transcends the bug status. I think they I don't know, maybe they'll make it. Maybe I'll keep them on. We'll see. Yeah, it's kind of hard to, like, when a butterfly lands on you to be like, ew, oh, get off of me. <laughs> yeah. I feel like butterflies and moths are really cool. Yeah, moths, I'm kind of like, yeah. All right, and then for my current team in Heart Gold, I've got Meganium, Umbreon, Amphros, Togetic, which I want to evolve, but I need to get... Dawn Stone. Yeah, I don't remember what it is. It's like a shiny stone or a dawn stone, whatever that is. Yeah, I need to get one of those to get Toka Kiss. And then I have got the shiny Gyarados. I decided to rock them this team or this time, and I've got Ho Oh as well. Okay, yeah, it sounds like you're ready for the league. Yeah, I think I'm going to take them on. But the thing is, I, I feel like my Umbreon is not up to its full potential yet because it's only at level 35, and it, I don't think it has like the best move set. Actually, just kidding. I gave it a TM, or maybe I didn't. Actually, the Sumbreon is stacked. It's got Shadow Ball, Quick Attack, Confusion Ray, and Sand Attack. But I might give them like a Rare Candy or something because they're level 35, which is, they're the lowest on my team, so. Dude, you're making me want to pick up my Pokemon again. Do it, man. You should do it. Is it possible to play any of like the older like DS titles on my Switch, like Heart Gold or anything like that, Dina? Not on your Switch. You have to bust out the 3DS or 2DS for that. I'm going to have to bust out the 3DS. Still have it. I think you should, man. I've been having a blast. It's honestly, it's so fun to return to it. You won't regret it, man, especially this cozy season. I mean, hey, this is something that I've discovered recently that I feel like you wouldn't have never known as a kid. But taking your DS to a coffee shop, like sitting down, doing some work, and then having like pulling the DS out, I feel like that's a vibe. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. It's, it's important to have some form of recreation with you, either, whether that be a book, a console, yeah. a good podcast. I mean, it's not like getting some work done and then listening to your favorite radio show. Called the Sticky Buttons Podcast. Yeah, so. <laughs> 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 yeah, man. There's, uh, I gotta try it. I gotta try it. I'm gonna bust out the old 3DS. You're making me want to play Hard Gold specifically. Dude, Just yeah, that. Blow the dust off. Yeah. All right. I guess this is a call to you, listener. Pull out the 3DS. Get it out. We'll bring Street Pass back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, all right. Well, I think we should end it up. I guess just thank you so much for listening. If you've made it this far, the best way to support us is to share the podcast with a friend. If you want to go the extra mile, you could rate us on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts. That would mean the world to us. And if you'd like to support us financially, you can back our Patreon and you'll get access to a couple of bonus episodes that we've done as well as um, access to our Minecraft server. Yep, yep. I think I saw Carter in there a little bit ago, so... Uh, okay, okay. Shout outs to Carter. That's awesome. <laughs> and uh, I think a few others have been in there as well. So just really excited about that. That's amazing. I feel like I was going to say something else. Oh, I recently put out a new episode of The Indie Nook. It was a solo show that I do. It's a little like 20 minutes. A new episode. It's about the Citizen Sleeper. I guess the DLC spoilers and the art book. That So some Citizen Sleeper content. And I've been streaming Starfield. And I've been putting that on our YouTube. And there's been a lot of support on that. So thank you. That's dope. If you're checking this out from that, uh, hello and welcome. But yeah, go check out those streams. I'm having a ton of fun role-playing as Blake Staghorn, the bounty hunting botanist. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. So there's plenty of ways to support us. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you want to shout so out much. any streams, Brandon? Thank you so much for tuning in. Last night I was streaming some Texas. 
So stay tuned on Twitch. Put on post notifications so you get alerts whenever I'm streaming. That's twitch.tv slash sticky munchkin. Just, oh, yeah. just like how you heard it. So stay tuned. 2K. Been playing lots of Texas. And soon, some Baldur's Gate 3. Looking forward to playing some Baldur's okay. Gate 3 for y'all. So, wow, that's exciting. Are you going to do that on stream? Yeah. Yeah, that one's going to be a stream stream game. That's exciting. Let me know when you start doing that. Maybe we can do a D&D themed yeah. episode. I have something else. I'm not going to say what it is, but I have something else that it might go really well with that. So. Awesome. <laughs> All right, I've actually got some D6 right here, Brandon. I'm going to, I've got two D6. What do you think the number is going to be? <laughs> two and four. Two and a four? It was a four and a five. So ah, okay, you're, okay, okay. You were pretty close. Okay. <laughs> do you, that was fun. Do you want to do that again? Two out of yeah, three? Yeah. I'm gonna <laughs> okay. Say, I'm going to say a six and a one. Six and a one, a seven. Ooh, that's a good guess. I got a six and a three. So you're, you're 50 50 here. All right. I'm going to go. All right. I'm going to go two and three. Two and a three. A one and a two. You <laughs> again. Wow. All right. We got to go uh, until you break this big, break the streak. All right. What, what it's going to be? All right. It's going to be double five. Double five. It was a five and a four. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're, you're, I don't, you're I don't still on. This is the casino, man. This is the casino <laughs> run of Sticky Bun Podcast. All right. Six and three. Six and three. Six and three. <laughs> Six and six, I shit you oh, not. Oh, <laughs> that's so unlucky. Man, that's crazy. Okay, all right. Once more. I mean, you're still called at 50% I'm gonna right go, each I'm time. I'm going to go with my birthday, two and five. Nah, scratch. Seven, four, and three. Damn, so a different kind of seven. But Yeah. I guess you still were kind of right because it was a seven, so. It's weird. I guess uh, that counts. Oh, <laughs> All right, Hello, we got to end this. <laughs> Um, I guess, yeah, that's it. Thanks Ended on a seven. To your favorite internet radio show, the Sticky Muns Podcast. Hell yeah. Thanks so much. Have a good one. Stay tuned. Bye. Bye.